The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented, transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. There are two ways to look at the future, with fear or with confidence. Now, if you know that your wife and children are protected against any eventuality, if you feel sure that your old age will be independent and comfortable, if you are sure your children will enjoy a college education, if you can plan to own your own home free and clear, if you know these things, then you can look at the future with confidence. Now, there is one man, a neighbor of yours, who has helped many others enjoy this feeling of confidence. He's your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. In about 13 minutes... I'd like to tell you more about this friendly, helpful man and how freedom from worry may be yours with membership in the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Kidnapping. Its title, The Evil Samaritan. It is the business of your FBI to investigate crimes within its jurisdiction. And in the carrying out of that business, it is necessary that your FBI know as much as possible about the habits of criminals. Because crime prevention is also of definite interest to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A recent study undertaken by your FBI revealed a fact which will seem odd to those of you who are law-abiding citizens. But there are seasons in crime just as there are seasons in every other business. During the fall and winter months, the criminal generally concentrates on crimes against property, crimes like auto theft, armed robbery, and burglary. But in the spring and summer months, the criminal's fancy turns to people, and the fashion is to commit crimes against the person. Crimes like felonious assaults and murder... Tonight's FBI file opens in a small private plane that is flying over the desert wasteland of one of our southwestern states. A young man is seated at the controls of the plane. He calls out to a girl who sits beside him. Alice? See that mesa down there on the left? Yes. That's our landmark. 20 minutes more and we're at the ranch. Kind of sorry to hear that. I really enjoyed this flight very much. Yeah. I hope you'll enjoy the ranch, too. Of course I will. Dick. Yeah? There's something I think I better tell you right now. Yeah? It's about your mother and dad. Dick, I'm scared to death about meeting them. Are you kidding? They're the sweetest guys you'll ever meet. I know all that, but you're their only son. We're engaged. Yeah, and they'll love it. I hope so. Alice, baby, will you please? Hey. Trouble, honey? I don't know. Yeah, we got trouble. What do we do? Just stay where you are, honey. Keep calm. I will. I think this motor's coming back. We're now at about 800 feet. I'm going to try to set it down easy. Well, you've got plenty of landing field. Miles and miles of desert. Well, it isn't as flat as it looks from here. If we're, if we're lucky, we'll hit a good spot. Tighten your safety strap, Alice. Sure. I'm afraid we're losing altitude too fast. I'm going to try to set it down right. Just level her off a little more. Dick, we're going to crash. Easy, easy, baby. Oh, Dick. Dick! Hold it, Hank. Oh, boy. Oh. There's that aeroplane. I told you I seen it fall. Yeah. Well, let's take a look. All right. 
plowed into the sand pretty deep, huh? Yeah. You think there's people in it, Mike? You'll find out right now. Oh, Rip. Let's have a look, see. All right. Well, it stayed in one piece anyway. Yeah. This looks like the door right here. I'll try it. There. Anybody in there? Yeah. Two of them. A man and a female. Alive? I'll see. Man's breathing. So's female. Uh, anything else in there? Yeah. Just looking around. Wait, here's some bags. I'll pass them on out to you. Okay. Here you are. Here's one of them. All right. Here's the other. I got it. What about them people? What about them? Well, ain't you going to search them before we go through the bags? No, I ain't. Why not? I'm thinking of lifting the people out, too. What for? So as we can tend to them. What's got any? Nothing. Well, why don't we take what we can here and just leave them be? Take a look at them bags. They cost plenty. So does a private aeroplane. Well, so what? So these here folks must be worth plenty of cash. We'll get lots more out of being nice to them. Well, I don't go along with that. Nobody's asking you to, Hank. But that's how we're going to do it. Now, give me a hand. Some 50 miles away from the scene of the plane crash, in an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is about to leave on an assignment. Say, Jim. Yeah, Bill? Don't forget we have an invitation to try out the new police rifle range this afternoon. Oh, I'm afraid I won't be able to go out there today, Bill. Oh, why not? A report just came in from the Indian agent down in Movie. What about? Well, there was a murder committed on the reservation last night. A man's body was found early this morning. Ah. What's the story? The victim was an archaeologist. His name was Adams. He came in from the east about three weeks ago. Plan to spend the summer on the reservation. I see. Did he work alone? Yeah. Well, how was he killed? Stabbing. In a fight? Well, I don't know, Bill. There hasn't been much evidence collected to date. Well, when was he last seen? Yesterday afternoon. He was believed to have been in the company of two other men. Any idea who they were? No. Not yet, but I think we have the motive, all right. What is it? Robbery. Oh. I understand it was generally known that this man Adams carried quite a bit of cash. Oh. And when his body was found, his effects were pretty well ransacked, but... Ironically enough, the thieves never found his money. How was that? Well, he wore it in a belt around his waist. His assailant didn't search him that closely. Oh, well, Jim, these two men that Adams was riding with sound like pretty good suspects. Yeah, yeah, but I can give you a better answer to that after I've been down there. Take it easy, mister. Uh, huh? Just lie still. Uh, where... Where am I? In the cabin. Mm. Oh. My, my leg. I think it's busted. No. How did... Wait. Where's Alice? Gal was she? in the plane with you? Yeah, yeah. She's right in the next room. How is she? Still passed out. What's wrong? Is she injured? What is it? Don't know. Uh, help me up, will you? I'll go in. No. I told you the leg was busted. Oh, who's with Alice? Anyone taking care of her? No. Well, why not? Now, look. We took you both from the airplane. Wasn't that enough? I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. I'm very grateful, too. Okay. Is this your cabin? Nope, but we're staying in it. Well, where's my plane? About 30 miles. Huh? How far from a town are we? About 30 miles. Who else is here beside yourself? My brother Mike. Your car? Nope. Horses. Oh. Uh, could one of you go to town at once? What for? A doctor. A young lady who was with me must need one. Looks so I do, too. Well, see what my brother said. Where is he? 
Out, sir? Yeah, please, would you call him in here? I'll talk to him first. T tell him I'll, I'll pay him well for his trouble. I'll tell him. I'll be back. That you, Hank? Yeah. How they doing? Well, fellas come, too. Yeah? Asked me to come out and talk to you. How come? He wants that one of us should go into town for a doctor. You tell him how far it is? Yeah. Said he'd pay you good for your trouble. How much? Didn't ask. You finished going through their bags? Yeah. Find anything? No cash, but I've been reading these here letters. This fella's family is real rich folks. They got a ranch 20-odd miles from here. Mm. You going to talk to him about getting a doctor? Yeah, I'll talk to him. Don't forget, he said he'd pay. <laughs> Hank, he's going to pay plenty. Bill, how things go on the rifle range? I didn't get there. I've been working on an assignment myself. Oh? Pick up anything down in Moby? Well, I think I have something to work on. I was lucky enough to find the knife that the killer used. Several good prints on the handle. Well, what about the two men on horseback? Oh, I just got a general description of them. Nothing really worthwhile. I'm going to get the knife off to the laboratory right now. I uh, say, uh, yeah? I'm sending out a set of prints myself. Oh, what on, Bill? Carl came in right after you left this morning. A family named Reed. Mm -hmm. They have a ranch about 20 miles out of town. I reported that their son had left Denver yesterday in his own plane. His fiancée was with him. Uh -huh. The plane was to arrive at the ranch early last evening. After it was several hours overdue, searching parties were sent out. Mm -hmm. Early this morning, the plane was spotted from the air. Pilot landed, examined young Reed's plane, and found it empty. Wow. There were blood stains in the cabin and numerous prints of horses hooves around the plane. Some clothing was strewn around the ground. Mm -hmm. Where'd you say that Reed's plane landed? On the Indian reservation. That's why the family called here. Mm -hmm. Did you go out and look it over? Yeah. Find anything? Just the fingerprints. Ah. Uh, well, Bill, I wouldn't say either one of us had an easy assignment. Go on in, Hank. Okay. Hey, where is he? Huh? He was stretched right out there in that bunk. He couldn't have come out. He was right by the door. Yeah, but I don't... He was probably in the next room with his girlfriend. But he couldn't walk. That leg of his would... Look, I told you. Yeah. Oh, Mr. This, here's my brother. Hello. I thought you couldn't walk. I dragged myself in here. Look, what about a doctor? She still passed out? Yeah, well, you got a doctor? Well, that sort of depends, mister. On what? On what you figure it's worth. Well, that's unimportant. Name your price. Okay. Ten thousand dollars. What? You heard me. Ten thousand? You don't have to pay, but we don't have to get no doctor. Well, now, look, you you can see for yourself this girl needs help. She's your girl, mister. Why don't you help her? Sure. You go get the doctor. What? <laughs> you know that's impossible. You know I can just barely move. Mm, then I figure you better pay. I haven't got it. You can get it easy enough. Just write a note to your folks. No. I, I happen to know their ranch is right close. Tell them to put up the money. Yeah, but they... Hank here can deliver the note. But they wouldn't stand for that. Yeah, I guess the girl don't get no doctor. Look, you have horses here. I'll go into town myself. You just stay put. No, I told me. Let me out. No, no. And he comes too, Hank. He'll write to his folks. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. But right now, let's discuss your own case. Let's say your income is average. Let's suppose you have Social Security. Would that be enough to keep your wife and children in comfort if something should happen to you? Now, that's a situation millions of breadwinners must face. If that's your problem, then you'll be interested in how Mr. Warren Hoyt solved this same problem through membership in the Equitable Society. Well, I have a wife and three children. My income is maybe a little better than average, but Social Security wouldn't be a drop in the bucket to my wife and youngsters if I passed along. 
That's where the Equitable Society comes into the picture. So you called your local Equitable Society representative? Just as you suggested on this program. Well, the first thing he did was bring along a chart that showed my wife and me how to figure out how much more we'd need in addition to our Social Security. That's the Equitable Fact-Finding Chart for Fathers and Mothers. It's free simply for the asking. Well, then my Equitable friend figured out a plan that would keep my family well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed until my youngest boy finished high school. That's the Equitable Family Security Plan. That's right. You know something else, Mr. Keating? I'd like to say our Equitable representative is a swell guy. Mr. Hoyt, all of our Equitable men are swell guys. Equitable representatives are selected for character, intelligence, and their attitude towards other people. They are thoroughly trained to solve life insurance problems. So if you have such problems, family security, education for your children, independence in your 60s, or home ownership, call your Equitable representative. There's no obligation. Ask him for your free copy of the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. He'll prepare a plan that will give you the most for your life insurance dollar. You have nothing to lose, perhaps everything to gain by consulting your local telephone directory or the name of your local Equitable Society representative. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Evil Samaritan. As you have seen aptly illustrated by tonight's case from the files of your FBI, there is no reasoning with the criminal mind, for there is neither logic nor compassion in the makeup of the criminal. The human being has no dignity as an individual to the criminal, because he has chosen to live his life outside the convention set up and obeyed by his fellow beings. That lack of regard for his fellow man is the basic reason for the lack of success of every criminal. For one thing is as true in crime as it is in every other field of life, and that is that unless we have a common and mutual loyalty, we are doomed, because no one person is entirely self-sufficient. To rephrase that point, which the criminal can never understand, we are indeed our brother's keeper. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk. He has just finished reading a laboratory report. Bell. Oh, Bell. Hey, yes, Jim. Come on over here a minute, will you? Surely. What do you want? Well, this report just came in from the laboratory. On the fingerprints you sent? On the prints we both sent them, Bill. They're identical. What? Yeah, they both belong to the same man. Well, what do you know? Who is it? A man named Michael Harvey, also known as Mike Harvey. What's his background? Well, he was arrested about 12 years ago for a bank job. He's also been in trouble with local police, several states. I see. He's always worked with his brother. His name is Henry Harvey, also known as Hank. Well, then they could be the two men who were seen with Adams that afternoon before he was murdered. Well, I would think so, yeah. Oh, I have a complete description here on both of them. Here, read it. Oh, thanks. Mm-hmm. You know, they must have come across that disabled plane. Yeah, and he undoubtedly took young Reed and his girlfriend along with him. That's right. You know where they can be found, where they live? No, but they're from these parts originally. Local police can probably help us on that. Yeah. Bill, I'll send out an alarm on these men. Good. I'll run over and talk to the police. How is he, Mike? Coming around. Hand me a dipper of water. Yeah, sure. His girlfriend was just mowing a little. I think she's coming around, too. Leave her in there. I don't want him to see her again until he writes the note. Okay. Give me the water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that done it. Please, I don't... <coughs> oh. I'm still here. That's right. Where's Alice? We moved you out of her room. She's still unconscious? Yeah. You still want the $10,000, eh? That's right. You feel like writing that note now, mister? Time's passing, you know. Okay, I'll write it. Good boy. Got a pencil, Hank? Yeah. No paper, though. Uh, there's a bag over there. Go get it. All right, I get it. 
Well, I say in the note. I'll tell you. Hey, yo. Here's a bag. Hey. There you are. You can write it right there on the floor. Here. Oh. Go ahead. Uh, dear folks, some good people saved my life. I'm staying with them. You got that okay? Staying with them. Uh-huh. What's your girl's name? Alice. Alice. All right. Say, um, me and Alice is okay. I want to pay these good people for helping me. Yeah. Give the man who brings this note $10,000. Wait, wait, wait. Come on, come on. $10. He will let you know where we are. You got all that? No. Where we are. Uh-huh. All right, then say, don't tell the law about this. And mark your name. What about a doctor? When they pay the cash, you'll get one. The whole purpose of writing this note is to get a doctor now. Look, just mark your name. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. This is Bill. Oh, hi, Bill. How'd you make out? Well, I've spent most of the afternoon here at police headquarters. The Harvey brothers turned up around here about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Lived at a hotel for about five days, then checked out. Well, then they have no home here, huh? No. But someone reported seeing them down near Movie the day before yesterday. Yeah. And they do have horses. We say they know the desert country like a book. Yeah, well, then they must be hiding out in the wasteland somewhere. Mr. Taylor? Uh, excuse me, Bill. Yes, Miss Brown. A message for you. Oh, thanks very much. Bill. Yeah? Hold on a second, will you? A message just came in. This is from Reed's parents. They just received a phone call from a man who claimed he has a note from their son. He told them he'd be right out to see them. Bill, I'd better get over to their ranch. What happened, Jim? Well, I've had a busy two hours. You got out to Reed's ranch in time? I had time to wait. What do you mean? The man who called him never showed up. Oh, that's too bad. It was one of the Harvey brothers, all right. How do you know? Well, when the man didn't appear, I questioned the Reeds about the phone conversation. They recall that he said he was telephoning from a drugstore. Yeah. Well, there's only two drugstores in the village. I went to both of them. I showed the storekeeper's pictures. I see. The uh, proprietor of one of them recognized the picture. The brother called Hank. Said that he had made a phone call there earlier and had inquired about a blacksmith shop. He'd come on horseback. Right? Yeah, yeah. I went over to the blacksmith shop the druggist had sent him to. Blacksmith told me that Harvey had left his horse there to be shod... Said he'd be back in an hour. Well, when was all this? Oh, I'd say about two hours ago. And did Harvey return? Yeah, he came back in five minutes. Blacksmith said he seemed very nervous, urged him to finish the job up quickly, and as soon as it was done, he rode away. Did the blacksmith learn where he was going? No, but he did say he had a 30-mile ride. Well, that doesn't tell us much. Well, it could if he hasn't had too much of a head start, Bill. I've got an idea. This is what I think we should do. It's all right, baby. I'm right here with you. Huh? I'm right beside you, darling. Oh, Dick. Dick, where are we? I'm going to be okay, honey. But the plane, what happened? After we cracked up, two men came along, took us here to this cabin. Oh. You passed out for a while, that's all. What happened to you? Why are you stretched out on the floor? Oh, I... Hurt my leg a little. Oh, Dick. There's a doctor coming soon. We'll both be tended to. Well, what about your wait, leg? Wait, wait, wait. She come too, huh? Yeah. What about your brother? He's coming back. Just seen him riding down the hill. Alone? Yeah. No doctor? Look, that happens after the payoff, remember? What's he talking about? No, nothing, honey. Well, what does he mean, payoff? I'll explain it all to you later. Mike! Mike! I'm in here. Well, how'd you make out? No good. What happened? Wouldn't the pay? I never delivered the note. How come? 
Because huh? I seen this newspaper before I went there. Look, our picture's right on the front page. What for? Knocking that guy off. The FBI found out we done it. But how? I don't know how. We got to blow out of here, Mike, fast. Yeah. Well, oh, what about them? They stay here. Dick, what's this all about? These men wanted money. $10,000. why? For you to leave here alive, lady, and we didn't get it. You still can't leave us here like this. I ain't gonna. But you just said... That I you... said I was leaving you here. I didn't say how. Come on, Mike. We're wasting time. I know. Now, wait a minute. What are you gonna do? What do you think? Put away that gun. Only after I'm done with it. Dick. Shut up. Drop that gun, huh? Mike, what? Drop it. All right, now raise your hands, both of you. Who are you? I'm from the FBI. Oh. Well, how'd you get here? We knew you had a 30-mile ride, and as much as planes travel faster than horses, we circled in a 30-mile radius until we picked up your trail. Thank you, stupid... All right, Bill. Let's get these people out of here. Tried in federal court for the murder on the government reservation... Both Mike and Hank Harvey were convicted and received the death penalty. The manner in which the criminals in tonight's case from the files of your FBI were caught illustrates how little chance the criminal has competing against the forces of law and order. For in this case, the criminals used horses and your FBI employed an airplane. With every field of science at their disposal, the various agencies of law enforcement your local police, your state troopers, and the special agents of your FBI have cut the chances for criminal success down to the barest minimum, have proved again and again that crime is always an unprofitable career. There are two ways to protect your family. First, safeguard your health. Second, safeguard their future. Your doctor is the man to see at least once a year to safeguard your health. Your local Equitable Society representative is the man to see to safeguard your future. You may be concerned about security for your wife and children. You may want to enjoy an independent and comfortable old age. You may want to own your own home free and clear. You may want to assure your youngsters a college education. Whatever your problem, your local Equitable Society representative is the man to see. He's helpful, friendly, and he knows the answers. Get in touch with him today. Consult your local telephone directory or the name of your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, Flight to Avoid Prosecution. Its title, The Frivolous Sisters. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Anthony Barrett, Ted DeCorsia, Lamont Johnson, John Stevenson, and Kay Stewart. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And let me remind you that in this national election year... One obligation of citizenship heads all the rest. The obligation of every qualified voter to choose his or her candidate, to register, and to go to the polls and vote. Tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Frivolous Sisters on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzie and Harriet come your way next. This program came to you from Hollywood.